are going to have a look at a one another statement that comes up in Colossians chapter 3. So turn tap to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to have a look at what it means to bear with one another. Colossians 3, reading from verses 12 through to verses uh, 14. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So I'm sure that by now you can see just how these one another statements and the passages of scripture that they come up in, how they all overlap with each other. So we've spoken about love one another from at least two or three passages in this series. Forgive one another has come up in multiple passages with other one another statements, which simply shows that these one another statements is not just another list of commands that you've got to keep which is a huge relief because there's over 100 of them. What this is building is a picture that, hey, this is not a list of rules. This is a way of life, of life in community. Remember, when you get saved, when you believe in Jesus and get reconciled in your relationship with God, you get saved personally, but you get saved into community. And just as you know, that moment you get saved, God works on you personally. He starts to work on a whole lot of personal aspects of your life, healing up hurts and brokenness and renewing this sense of purpose and identity. Just as he works on you personally at the same time, because you're saved not just personally, but into community, He will also work on your ability to contribute in community in a way that is fruitful and productive and life-giving for the community. He will work on that area as well. Hence, all of these one another's. He will work on your ability to love others, not just Him, love others, to bear each other's burdens, to serve one another, to pray for one another, and He will work on our ability to bear with one another, which is what we're having a look at today, to bear with one another, which is different to the one another statement that Justin preached on in week two, which was to bear one another's burdens, to bear with one another uh, is connected to the idea, the other one another statement in this passage, which is to forgive one another. And what it simply means is this, to do everything you can to live peacefully in unity with other people who may not make that easy. To put it quite, bl quite bluntly, to bear with one another means to put up with one another, which is a very necessary baseline attitude that protects community and protects relationship. But it is also an attitude that I'm sure you can understand is far easier said than done, which is why Bear with one another is preceded by a list of five essential virtues. It is only by employing these five virtues, it is only by these virtues being expressed in your heart and in your life, that you will have this ability to put up with, to bear with one another and therefore protect relationship and protect community. Here are these five virtues that came up in this passage. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Without these virtues, it is impossible 
to bear with one another and protect relationship and community. So we're going to walk through those five virtues. We're going to spend more time on the virtues than the one another statement and then sum up what bear with one another means. But before we get there, let's just push pause and reflect on the opening words of this passage, which are critical. Verse 12 opens like this. Put on, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and loved. In the Bible, you will always find that before you are told what to do, you are told who you are. In the Bible, you will always find before you are told what to do or how to behave or how to act, you are reminded first who you are. In other words, our do follows our who. And who you are, just pause and reflect on this. Drink it up. It's beautiful. The amazing privilege of being a Christian. Who you are is chosen, holy, loved. Therefore, because you are chosen, made holy, and loved, make sure these virtues are present in your life. The order is critical because you do not practice these virtues. Patience, kindness, meekness, compassion. You don't practice these virtues in order to be chosen or approved by God, in order to be loved by God or earn His affection, or in order to prove your righteousness. You already are those things given to you by Jesus. Now may they become evident in your life. Because in the Bible, always, what you do follows who you are. So as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, be sure to see these five virtues evident and growing in your life in order to bear with one another and protect relationship. Let's walk through these five virtues. Number one, compassion. The word for compassion there is really, it's a very compelling word picture. It literally means to be moved to your bowels, your spleen. Talks about this gut-wrenching feeling of sympathy, what you feel when you see somebody in pain. You're moved. And that being moved deeply inside leads you to act on their behalf. This was largely what Justin referred to in week two, bearing one another's burdens. You're so moved. Pity, compassion, sympathy, similar kinds of words that you act to help them. And to be sure, flourishing community requires us to bear one another's burdens. However, in this instance, as we talk about bear with one another, put up with one another, compassion relates to that simply by recognizing that, hey, everybody you come into contact with in Christian community I mean in life, <laughs> even in your workplace, your household, everybody you come into contact with is carrying their own hurts, their own stresses, their own anxieties, their own broken hopes and broken dreams. And they carry that with them. Carry that into the workplace. Carry that into church. See, so compassion opens our eyes when we come against somebody's potentially prickly personality. Compassion enables us to look deeper and wonder what it is they are carrying. or What in their life or what in their story has led to them expressing themselves in this perhaps difficult way. So compassion is essential in so many ways to flourish in community as we help each other, but as we bear with one another, it means as we come into contact with each other, to always be thinking 
about what it maybe is that they're going through that is leading to a particular behavior that is making it difficult to be in relationship with them. Compassion is an essential first ingredient to protecting relationship and protecting community. Secondly, kindness. So kindness takes compassion a step further. Compassion is this ability to see beyond, to sympathize, perhaps even empathize with what people are going through and understand how that makes them behave the way they do. But what kindness will do is take that further and actually act, do a good act, a gracious act. That's what kindness is. It's a gracious act of goodness. It's, it's doing something. It's really kind, really good for somebody even though or despite or especially when they don't deserve it. The heart of kindness is a gracious act, an undeserved, even unprovoked act of goodness. And in this context of bearing with one another is an act of goodness when it's just really difficult to do that because of the disturbance in the relationship. So to kind of illustrate this, it always sort of takes me back to the pre-marriage counseling that Kristen and I were doing before we were married with dear friends of ours. And I remember them just talking through some of these kind of attitudes that we need to hold on to in marriage and kind of talking about the reality that in the future there's going to be these disagreements, these difficult moments. And kindness is the ability to, despite perhaps having an argument, being in this difficult state with each other, the kindness would be to step into that and like, you know, maybe just like for me to offer Kristen a cup of coffee, you know, just, which is so counterintuitive, sounds easy, but like in the midst of that, when you, you know, I make the coffee in the house, obviously, because that's my thing. And we just, the intuition, no, I'm going to withhold that because you're in this difficult space. So kindness would be, despite this prickly situation and me feeling the way I am and maybe anxious to step in, hey, can I make you a cup of coffee. That was explained to me as what kindness is. And as our friend was leading us, was saying, hey, and what that will do is that'll just kind of bring all the hostility down. Some of the things you may just find, hey, it's like everything is like mended with this act of kindness. And I have found, tried that and found that, that to be absolutely untrue. It just... Hasn't worked in that way. Their hostility doesn't sit down, but hey, at least you got the cup of coffee, right? So there's something. But you know what? I mean, that, that is what kindness means, this ability to step. And it may not, instantly, like, it may not just reduce the hostility, but it is this essential ingredient in protecting relationship especially when there is difficulty. It may not dissolve it right away, but it sure does protect it. Obviously, this word kindness is often, perhaps most often used to describe how God relates to us. These gracious acts of goodness despite deserving it, right? That's Ephesians 2 verse 7 in the coming ages, that he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So kindness is the second important ingredient to enable us to bear with one another and protect relationship, to protect community. Third virtue that comes up in this passage is Humility. I want to spend a little bit more time on this virtue because humility has got to be one of the most essential Christian virtues. Humility. You know, at the time that this was written, kind of the ancient world, the ancient Greek world, the humility wasn't considered a virtue, it was considered a weakness. You were considered weak for displaying 
humility. And then Christianity comes along and just turns it around and makes humility perhaps the most prized virtue. And why is that? Well, it's because the essence of of Christianity or the core of the gospel is wrapped with humility. We would not be anywhere without this idea of humility because if you think about it, this is what is displayed in Jesus Christ who is God and de became dethroned, took on human flesh, humbled himself took our sin on him, ultimately was killed in our place, killed, in our, died for us to rescue us. The gospel exists because of this idea of humility. You know, I'm already thinking about this as we head into December and Christmas time comes up. You know, Christmas, you, you almost can't talk Christmas. I mean, it's crazy we're talking about Christmas already, right? But you almost can't talk Christmas without this idea of humility, with the Savior born in the stable and, and the shepherds. I mean, it's an essential part of the story. And something, and we, we're going to develop this a little bit, perhaps, in, in the next coming month as we journey towards uh, a Christmas. So we'll talk a bit more about humility then. But I've just recently just been so inspired to think more deeply about this Christian virtue. Just something profound I heard recently I want to share with you is that humility at its heart is about truth. Humility is about truth. The opposite, pride, is a lie. Humility is truth. Pride is always a lie. See, a humble person knows the truth, the truth about themselves. They know that they actually have absolutely no reason to boast about any achievements or any accomplishments or anything in their lives because they know the humble person, the Christian, follows Jesus, who receives the gospel cloaked in humility, the humble person knows that everything good is a gift. A gift of God's grace. Unmerited, undeserved is His kindness to us. That's the truth about us. It's all a gift. That's why Paul will say, for example, in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6 to 7, he's speaking, he says, I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers and sisters, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Hold on to that. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? And if then you received it, as in didn't earn it, if then you received it as a gift, why do you boast as if you didn't receive it, as if you earned it, as if it was all you? See, we, we love to, when we've achieved something, we, humans, we have this, this tendency to think we're self made but if you just just think about it as from the christian worldview this is why to the rest of the world doesn't make sense but from the christian worldview man trace it all back like we don't have choice over when we were born over the particular abilities that we were born with the opportunities that were placed before us the situations we were placed into I mean, that's all, that, that's all God. And even though many of you like, have struggled through life and you've done that and some of the circumstances have been difficult and it's commendable how you've struggled and still achieved despite difficult circumstances, if you think about it as a Christian, 
even that ability to persevere was grace given by God. It's just when you pause for long enough. As a Christian, you realize everything that's good. That was the grace of God all along. It's all grace. That's the truth. Truth is, it's all grace. Pride is a lie. Pride is actually lying to others and lying to ourselves. Boasting is a lie about how good we are when we realize the truth. Having said that, realize this. Humility is truth, so humility brings us down to reality. But humility being truth also brings us up. There's a misconception about humility that humility is thinking less about yourself. Thinking you're a terrible person. Or, no, no, no. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking accurately about yourself. Humility is truth. And the truth is you are chosen, holy, loved. Humility as truth does two beautiful things. It brings us down from pride, which is a lie, and realize, hey, that was all the grace of God. But also, humility brings us up. Hey, the grace of God, with this accurate view of who we are, is infinitely loved, chosen, called, accepted, all of those beautiful things. That's humility. Now, what humility does in community so like compassion, an essential Christian virtue for so many things, the essence of our walk with God. But in community, what we're talking about today, bearing with one another, what humility does is, I mean, it's quite, it just equates us. It kind of brings us all down from this distinction of being better than. No, 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 we're, it's all grace for all of us. It's all God. It brings us all down. Brings us all up. So there's all this equal view of each other. And therefore, this is why Paul says in that verse I just read to you, therefore there's no way to be puffed up in favor of one against the other. Because humility just brings us, neutralizes us all. Because it's all grace. Humility, essential feature for protecting relationship and protecting community, which is why in some of the other one another statements that have come up, so unity of mind, humility is there. You're going to find it present in almost anything that has to do with community and relationship. All right, that was number three. Fourth virtue is meekness. Meekness, that does not sound super grand, doesn't sound like something that you would want to pursue because meekness sounds like weakness. So this word meekness is, is, is exact, it's the word gentleness. It comes up in the fruits of the Spirit, gentleness. Which is simply this. Again, it's not this idea of weakness. It's the ability to not fight everything. In other words, meekness isn't weakness, but actually power under control. It's recognizing that, hey, like you could step in, yeah, like you could fight this and you could crush the other person, like you, you could, but you choose not to. I've always kind of thought of it like this. You think of like some kind of superior mixed martial arts, EFC fighter, boxer kind of person that just has the ability to annihilate and comes up against someone and could crush them, but chooses not to. That's meekness, not weakness. Having the ability to dominate, having the ability to assert your authority, having the ability to crush, having the ability to win, but choosing not to. That's gentleness. That's meekness, which is, again, essential for Christian community. So I'm sure you've heard the phrase before, pick your battles. Uh, it's life wisdom, that's just 
super important. Pick your battles. Well, that's attributed to General Patton, U.S. commander in World War II, who also said this, never fight a battle where you won't gain anything by winning. Never fight a battle where you won't gain anything by winning. Now, this is a commander speaking. You think about it in context of war, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it would be crazy to think about deploying troops and weapons and resources and suffering casualties for a battle where the outcome is like, well, it didn't really matter. You would never do that. That's nuts. And yet, we do this all the time. Fight all these meaningless battles. As I've commented before, this is the age of outrage. We are all mad about everything at the same time. We're all armed to the teeth with the arguments that we get on the internet and all sorts of other fake news sources. And so we're armed and we're ready and we are fighting everything. And if you think about it, like, never fight a battle where you won't gain anything by winning. How much are we winning? How much are we gaining? How much ground are we gaining? Through some of the arguments that we're having. Online, in community. And this is why the Bible often talks about, often talks about, do not get caught up in foolish controversies, in quarreling, in arguing over words. Bible often talks about that. Hey, don't concern yourself with battles that are meaningless. I just want to urge you to think about just how much of what you're outraged about, how many of maybe the online battles you're having or other battles you're having, are actually, actually, actually there's something to gain by winning it. Or how much of it is just trying to prove that you're right, stronger than or better than. See, that's why meekness has got to follow humility, has got to follow compassion, has got to follow kindness. To be sure, there are battles that we must fight. We pick them. Most of our skirmishes, skirmishes are a useless waste of time, energy, emotion, and are destructive to community. Let's not let those things creep in. And just, just remember in this passage... I've mentioned marriage a couple of times. That's not just because it's like this relevant idea. But Colossians 3 flows right into a discussion of marriage. Which is why this idea of kindness in marriage is appropriate. And I mean, meekness. How many of the arguments are just absolutely useless? Fifth virtue is patience. You could understand how important patience is to protecting relationship and protecting community. So patience simply means long-tempered as opposed to short-tempered. It's literally the idea of having a long fuse as opposed to a short fuse, which is interesting. That's how the Bible paints this word, patience. It's interesting because it does include the idea that, that yeah, you will get angry but it's the ability to control that, to put it off and control it. The Bible doesn't say never get angry. There's some things we're supposed to get angry about. But what it does speak about patience is this idea of it's certainly not exploding at, at one simple provocation, long-tempered, and it's certainly not uncontrolled rage. Patience is this ability to put it off and act justly as required when the time is right. And so you might recognize this characteristic, again, as a characteristic of God, as all of them are. We reflected on kindness. It's in all of them, humility. Here it is as well. God is patient, but in this sense, does it mean he never gets angry? For example, ex, um, Second Peter 3 verse 9 to 10 says the, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but he's patient toward you 
not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will pass away, heavenly bodies will be burned up in the earth, and the works that are done will be exposed. God is patient. doesn't mean justice or action is never coming. But that he's been patient in giving time. That's essential for a protecting relationship in community. Again, to apply it to a marriage situation. I spoke about some marriage advice we got from pre-marriage. Here's some good advice I got from Kristen's father. So Kristen's an artist and her parents are like superlative artists. They're doctors, professors of art at university. So completely a world different to me. And they both work very, it's a painting and work very much with clay. And so dad sat me down a couple nights before we got married and he gave me this advice, father to son-in-law. And he spoke about like working with clay. And he said, hey man, you know what? When I'm working with clay and I get clay on my jeans, like wet clay, do you know what happens if you try to clean that out? Like you take a cloth and, and try to rub out wet clay, it just makes a, a mess, smudge all over. So what you've got to do to get the clay out of your jeans is you've got to first let the clay dry. And then when it's dry, you just like dust it just falls away. I'm like, oh, thank you. That's really great for when I do sculpture, which will be never. Then he said this, you're going to need to take some time in being married to my daughter to let the clay dry. And what he was speaking about, he just shared with me. Like, so for me, that means like, when I get angry, when I'm prompted to anger, like I go take a walk, I walk the dog. And I just, I just tell Ruth, my wife, and say, I'm going to let the clay dry. And what that means is giving time. See, that's patience. It's the ability to lengthen the views, long-tempered. And often, time is such an incredible gift. It gives us perspective. You come back and you just dust off, and it just falls right away. Those are the five virtues. And when you take these five virtues, and when they're evident in your life, they unlock the capacity to bear with one another. To put up with one another. Which sounds like, it doesn't sound that important, does it? Put up with one another it doesn't sound super spiritual. But it's this baseline attitude that protects relationship in community, that protects relationship in marriage, as we've seen. And actually, it's this supreme act of the will, the ability to persevere, the ability to endure, to protect community. So, as I end off, please don't underestimate the simple power of bearing with one another. Bear with one another at home. Especially at home. That's why the Bible goes into that. Bear with one another at home. Bear with one another at work. In your friendship circles. At church in your community group. In your ministry team. In the people we gathered around to worship with every Sunday. This simple imperative, this simple command... It's the baseline of community. Without it, without the ability to bear with one another, we collapse. In fact, it's so important to Christian community that it's only by becoming like Jesus we make this happen. So again, did you notice all these virtues? Characteristics of Jesus Christ himself. Compassion. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. It takes the very nature of Christ to make bearing with one another possible. The good news is, that's exactly what Jesus does with us. By His Spirit, He empowers and enables us to become like Him. So that we can be kind and compassionate and humble and patient and gentle. And thereby preserve, protect relationship and community. So let's pray. As we pray, we really want to take some time to just kind of let these things bubble to the surface. Think through these virtues and perhaps 
man, where I'm lacking in it. Patience, kind of get the impression with everything we're all going through, we all need help. Compassion, we become immune to that, so filled with our own hurt. It's just so much. <laughs> so let's pray. Jesus Christ, as we reflect on these virtues, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness or gentleness, and patience, we recognize, God, I recognize that these virtues are, are being crushed, being held down, locked away. Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, would you open them up in my life and in our lives. And as you gather there, where, wherever you are, you might just want to think through just one of those in particular where you feel convicted. Just ask God to enlarge that virtue in your life, whether it's compassion or kindness, humility, Gentleness, patience. God, you know us and you lovingly by your spirit convict and bring to the surface all of these things so that we can repent of them and receive the empowering of your spirit. We would love to see these virtues blossom, grow in our lives for the sake of those around us for the sake of Christian community, for the sake of your witness in the world. So help us do this in Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen.